Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today, we're revisiting the battle between the Ryzen 7 1800X and the Core i7 6900K. And this, this is a bit of a special battle. So let me explain why. Prior to the Ryzen 7 series launching in March of 2017, if you wanted a modern 8-core desktop processor, you had one choice, and that was the Core i7 6900K. Today's video is sponsored by Corsair and their Void Pro RGB and HS70 wireless gaming headsets. Both offer an exceptional audio experience using specially tuned 50mm neodymium speaker drivers, and the premium build quality means they're not just highly durable, but also very comfortable. Both offer a 16 hour runtime with a slew of other features, so for more information, please check them out via the link in the video description. The 6900K was a Broadwell eBay CPU supporting eight cores, 16 threads, and it was clocked at a frequency of 3.2 gigahertz for the base, but it would clock as high as 3.7 gigahertz for the boost. It packed what was at the time a very fat 20 megabyte L3 cache. It also supported quad channel DDR4 2400 memory, 40 PCIe 3.0 lanes, and it was rated at 140 watts for the TDP. So essentially it was a beast. The only problem with this beast was that it cost $1,090 US. And that was a pretty big jump up from the already overpriced $340 US quad core Core i7 7700K. But with no alternatives to speak of, Intel were free to set pricing as they saw fit. So charge an arm and a leg they did. However, roughly a year later, people were finally liberated by AMD's Ryzen 7 series. Eight cores for half the price, or even better if you look at the 1700X and 1700. Well, I suppose that's close enough to the truth. Yes, the 1800X offered eight cores at half the price of the 6900K, but it wasn't exactly a direct competitor. The 6900K is a member of Intel's high-end desktop platform and as such offers significantly more PCI Express lanes when compared to mainstream offerings. So if you wanna hang multiple workstation class GPUs off your CPU, some high-speed storage, and any other bandwidth hungry devices you might need, a high-end desktop CPU will be required. And the Ryzen 7 series really wasn't an option for such users, as it packs just 16 PCIe lanes and they're required by the discrete graphics card. Nevertheless, the Ryzen 7 series was still hugely exciting, as not everyone requires a workstation class CPU. Eight core processors are still extremely beneficial for mainstream users, gamers, and even content creators. Back in 2017, it was mostly just streamers that found the 8-core desktop CPU useful for gaming, but today modern games are starting to put them to use. And this is pushing streamers towards 12 and even 16 core parts. The point is though, before Ryzen, those of you who could benefit from 8 cores had to make do with 4, unless you took out a small loan to grab something like the Core i7-6900K. Processors like the 1800X really have helped bridge the gap between mainstream and high-end desktop Intel CPUs. Moreover, it's those who didn't require the extra PCIe lanes who saw the 1800X as a direct competitor to the 6900K, and it's easy to see why once we get benchmarking. And I should note that AMD did later blow Intel's high-end desktop processor range out of the water. Well, that's subjective, but I, I believe they did. And they did so in late 2017 with Threadripper, and perhaps that's a battle that we can revisit at a later date. For now, let's focus on the Ryzen 7 1800X and the Core i7-6900K, though I have also thrown in the 7700K results from last week. All CPUs were tested with G-Skills Flare X DDR4 3200CL14 memory, the 7700K and 1800X used two 8GB modules, while the 6900K gets four, as this is required to take advantage of its quad-channel memory controller. Then, as usual, the GPU of choice is the GeForce RTX 2080 Ti. Okay, let's get into the benchmarks. Kickstarting the benchmarks, we have Cinebench R20's multi-core test, and here the Core i7-6900K is 6% slower than the 1800X out of the box. However, once both CPUs are overclocked, the 6900K did jump into the lead, and now it's 5% faster than the 1800X, with a score of 4,039 points. Then, as we have a look at the single core performance, it's interesting that the 1800X wins out of the box, but it does have a higher clock speed. The 6900K is limited to 3.7 GHz for its turbo single core clock speed, and as a result, it was 9% slower in this test. That said, once overclocked, it was able to beat the 1800X, this time by a 6% margin. 
Next up, we have WinRA. Now, for the upcoming Zen 2 content, I would like to just make it clear that I will be including both WinRA and 7-Zip in the benchmarks. I know these days 7-Zip is widely regarded as the superior application, but for this video, we only have WinRA, so it is what it is, and this application does favor memory balance and latency over, well, pretty much everything else. For that reason, the 6900K and its quad channel memory configuration just cleans up. But this is still interesting to look at because as you can see, for memory sensitive workloads, the 6900K really does enjoy a massive advantage over the 1800X. However, for video editing tasks, the 1800X and 6900K are much more evenly matched. In fact, out of the box, the 1800X was 8% faster, taking just 508 seconds to complete the workload. That said, once both CPUs were overclocked, the 1800X became 5% slower. Not a big difference either way, and it's fair to say for encoding performance, they are very similar. Moving on to V-Ray, and here we see out of the box, performance is virtually identical between the 6900K and 1800X. That said, the higher overclocking ceiling of the 6900K allowed it to pull ahead by a 13% margin. So a strong result here for the Intel CPU, but overall the much cheaper 1800X was very impressive. We find a similar story with Corona. Here the 1800X was 5% faster out of the box, but once overclocked the 6900K was 11% faster. And it's the same story with Blender. Out of the box, the 1800X was 9% faster, but once overclocked the 6900K hit the lead by a 5% margin. Overall though, these results do bode well for AMD's much more affordable 1800X. When it comes to total system power consumption, the 6900K is more efficient out of the box, as AMD had to be a bit too aggressive with the 1800X, pushing it well out of its efficiency window, or at least the efficiency window of the manufacturing process. However, once overclocked, the 6900K did gobble up slightly more power, though overall both CPUs did consume roughly the same amount of power here. Okay, time for some gaming benchmarks. And first up we have Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and here the 6900K shows the 1800X who is boss. Stock the 6900K just about maxes out the RTX 2080 Ti, delivering almost 20% more frames than the 1800X, though I should note that the frame time performance was just 10% higher. Overclocked, the 1800X does fare a bit better in its fight against the 6900K, but even so, the high-end desktop processor was still 12% faster on average. As you'd expect, the margins close up even more at the GPU limited 1440p resolution, and once the CPUs are overclocked, there's really very little in it. Moving on to Battlefield 5, and here we see little to no difference between the 1% low performance of the 6900K and 1800X. Yet despite that, the 6900K was around 12% fast when looking at the average frame rate. Moving to 1440p basically neutralizes the results, and here the 1800X and 6900K push the RTX 2080 Ti to very similar frame rates. Okay, so I know these results look a bit too favorable for the 6900K, but I can assure you they're accurate. In fact, the 6900K is very similar to the 9900K in this title. Even out of the box, the 6900K was almost 20% faster than the 1800X, but once you overclock both CPUs, that margin is extended to almost 40%. In fact, the 6900K was 51% faster when comparing the 1% low performance, and that's pretty insane. Those margins are significantly reduced though at 1440p as we become more GPU bound. But even so, once overclocked, the 1% low performance of the 6900K was still 27% higher. Moving on to the Division 2, here the 1800X and 6900K are much more evenly matched, though again, it's the overclock performance that gets the 6900K ahead in these closer battles. And we see that once again, increasing the resolution, the margins previously seen are basically eliminated, and now the 6900K and 1800X deliver the same performance. As we've found in the past, Far Cry is not a good title for Ryzen processors, and despite the 6900K losing to the 7700K, it's still well ahead of the 1800X, especially once overclocked. Even at 1440p, the 6900K remains well ahead of the 1800X, and we see that the overclocked results are, well, they're quite brutal, really. World War Z isn't a very CPU demanding game, but even so, the 6900K was clearly faster than the 1800X here. But because we're talking about well over 130 FPS at all times, the margins here really aren't a big deal. As you'd expect, there's also very little difference at 1440p, but again, the 1800X does trail the 6900K by a small margin. Rage 2 also isn't a particularly CPU demanding title, and therefore even at 1080p with an RTX 2082, we see very little difference between the tested CPUs, and that being the case at 1080p, we see a very similar thing at 1440p. The Hitman 2 results are quite interesting. Stock the 6900K managed to match the 7700K, making it 18% faster than the 1800X. 
However, once overclocked, that margin is blown out to almost 30% as the 1600K lays waste to the 1800X and also beats the 7700K by a handy margin. Even at 1440p, Intel's high-end desktop 8-core processor remained well ahead of the 1800X, particularly once both processors were overclocked. The Ryzen 7 processor performs very well in Total War 3 Kingdoms, matching the 6900K out of the box, and it was only slightly slower for the 1% low performance once both CPUs were overclocked. That being the case, there was simply no separating the two at the more GPU-limited 1440p resolution. So, a good result here for the Ryzen 7 processor, and I think that'll just about do it for the benchmarks. Right, so there you have it. Unsurprisingly, the Core i7 6900K is still a beast in 2019. Basically, if it could clock a bit higher, it would essentially be a beefy Core i9 9900K. And they both use Intel's low latency ring bus architecture, and this is why I much prefer the 6900K to the newer Core i7 9800X. I mean, yeah, the 9800X is much cheaper, but obviously times have changed. The 9800X was released in late 2018, whereas the 6900K was released in mid-2016. Whenever we revisit older processors like this, I'm constantly reminded of how much of a shame it is that Intel has to continually axe platform support. Though I suppose having said that, as good as the 6900K still is, at the current secondhand asking price, which is typically about $400 US, they're not particularly great value when you can snap up a Threadripper a 1950X secondhand for about the same amount. Then of course, if you don't require all those extra PCIe lanes, something like the 1800X uh, for under $200 is really hard to pass up, especially when it can be thrown on a modern and still well-supported platform. So grabbing an 1800X for around $150 US, it's not really a challenge. And with the 3800X about to hit shelves, I'd say it's going to be even easier to find cheap 1800X processors. Still, looking back at the situation in 2016, you can easily see why AMD priced the 1800X at $500. They really, well, they realistically couldn't have charged any more, and I think they knew that, which is why there was a $400 version of the same product called the 1700X. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to take anything away from the first gen Ryzen 7 series. It was phenomenally good, but it was good because it was priced appropriately. Back in 2016, the first gen Ryzen series found itself in a bit of an awkward spot. It was inferior to the 7700K at the time when it came to gaming performance, but could hang in there and even beat the 6900K for a lot of productivity workloads, but then it lacked the features to compete as a high-end desktop part. Moreover, most games and applications were flat out utilizing a quad-core processor at the time, let alone an 8-core 16-thread processor. Today though, with software and game requirements what they are, I feel as though AMD probably could have gotten away with a $500 Ryzen 7 part with no cheaper alternatives to speak of. But in 2016, that simply wasn't going to fly. Anyway, I think it's fair to say in 2019, the 1800X is still largely inferior to the 600K in terms of performance, but it is still less than half the price. In fact, it's a little better than half the price. So again, for those who don't need the extra PCIe lanes, the 1800X is clearly the better buy. And then I'd argue if you do need the PCIe lanes, then the 1950X would be the better buy. Wrapping this video up, there is one more thing I should talk about, and that is Broadwell E overclocking. It has been quite some time since I broke out my Broadwell E test rig, so yeah, I have done plenty of overclocking with it in the past, but I haven't done anything recently. So for this video, I just referred to my previous notes on how I overclocked my 6900K chip uh, and how I got it happily to 4.3 gigahertz with 1.3 volts. So I jumped into the BIOS, I tuned the necessary settings, and then I booted into Windows. And initially it seemed like good news. The system booted straight into Windows, it was completely stable, and I got testing. However, right away, I knew there was something a bit off because the Cinebench R20 results, while they were improved, they weren't improved by, uh, to, the, to the degree that I would have expected them to be improved by, let's say that. After a little snooping around, I noticed the CPU was only boosting to 3.7 gigahertz. So it was kind of like an MCE overclock. I thought that was a bit odd. So I reset and I jumped back into the BIOS. All the settings were correct as far as I could tell. I did a little bit of tinkering, booted back into Windows, and I was faced with the same issue, a 3.7 gigahertz cap. 
I messed around for a lot longer than I care to admit trying to solve this issue before giving up and referring to Google for some help. It wasn't long before I found thread after thread of Broadwell E owners complaining about the same issue, and it turns out in late 2018 Microsoft released a Windows 10 update that broke Broadwell E overclocking. However, you can't just blame Microsoft or Windows on this one, rather it was a joint effort between Microsoft and Intel when addressing the Spectre Variant 2 vulnerability. This Windows update, along with an Intel microcode update, disables BIOS overclocking, and there's really no way around it unless you remove the update and roll back to an earlier BIOS revision. What I was forced to do for this video was apply the overclock in the BIOS, and then once that was done, load into Windows, open up the Intel X2U software, and then reapply the overclock. That would then see the overclock stick in Windows and I could test the CPU at 4.3 gigahertz. The problem with this method is you have to open the XTU software and then manually reapply the overclock every single time. So it's hardly a practical solution. I took to Twitter to check if anyone had come up with a better solution and no one had. The best solution came from Twitter user Just Plain Earl, who suggested base clock overclocking, and that does work. So he uses a 125 megahertz base clock, and this gets his 6850 to 4.2 gigahertz, which is 150 megahertz down from the previous 4.4 gigahertz he was hitting using the multiplier method. So he wasn't happy about this, but he noted it's better than nothing. I can certainly understand why he's mad. Imagine spending 620-ish dollars US on an unlocked six core 12 thread high-end desktop processor only to have the unlocked functionality basically disabled a few years later and a few years later when you really need it the most. You'd think the downgraded performance seen when addressing these various vulnerabilities was enough, but it seems Broadwell E owners have to contend with the overclocking headroom taking a hit as well. And I suppose on that miserable note, I'm going to end that video here. <laughs> if you did enjoy the video, be sure to hit the like button. You can subscribe for more content. And if you appreciate the work we do at Harambox, then consider supporting us on Patreon. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.